Well, hello, everybody. I um, hope you can see my screen, but I want to thank you all for joining this session today on writing effective policy memos. So this session is organized by the Journal of Science Policy and Governance, and it's a part of this year's NSPN symposium that's focused on adapting to a changing planet. So my name is Nicole Parker. Um, and I'm currently serving as the Director of U.S. Outreach for the Journal of Science Policy and Governance. I will be moderating this session, and um, you can see here my Twitter, Twitter handle is Nikki P underscore PhD, um, and you can follow JSPG at SciPy Journal as well. We, we hope this event will be both informative and useful for all of you. And we are also eager to see your writing skills when we go into our breakout room activity later on in the workshop. So this particular um, session is very focused around the 2021 policy memo competition special issue that was focused on intersectional science policy. So looking at how diversity, equity, inclusion intersects with a lot of science policy issues. Um, this issue was published in collaboration with the National Science Policy Network, and you can check out this issue on our website, and we have the link below. Um, and so now I would like to take the time to introduce you to some of our 2021 Policy Memo Competition participants, um, and they'll be leading the bulk of the presentation today. So um, first we have Brittany Barr is she's a postdoctoral researcher at University of Wisconsin Madison, um, and then we also have Yuki Hebner here, who is a PhD candidate at UCLA, and then we have Tara Miller, who is a PhD candidate at Boston University. So at this time, we'll have our speakers introduce themselves in the order that you see here on the slide, um, and they'll give you a bit more details about themselves and discuss their interests in science policy and also why they chose to, you know, publish in our journal. Brittany, over to you. Hi, everybody. I'm Brittany. Uh, I'm a postdoc at the Wisconsin Institute of Discovery. Um, as uh, Nicole already mentioned, um, I study the role of the 3D genome in um, cancer. And um, my interest in um, science policy, um, I'm primarily a data science, so I like work at the intersection of data science and science policy, um, really looking at uh, data-driven science policy decisions. So um, that's kind of where my interest lies. Hi, I'm Yuki and I'm also um, a PhD student. I'm at UCLA and like Brittany, I also study the 3D genome and I apply that to understand human neurodevelopment. And policy interest wise, I'm interested in how the intersection of public health and safety and education affect um, neurodevelopment, especially in adolescents. I'll pass it on to Tara. Thanks. Hi, folks. I'm Tara. I'm a PhD student in biology. I'm an ecologist studying how climate change is affecting plants and animals. And my science policy interests include climate change and conservation. And I'll pass it back to Nicole. Thank you all. And so thank you for your introductions and you'll be hearing a lot more from them later on today. Um, and so now we'll kind of just get into the logistics of the session today. Um, I encourage all of you to have your camera on, but I also want to um, let you know that if you are not speaking, please remember to mute yourself so we don't have any background noise. You can put any questions that you have in the chat throughout the presentation. Um, we will address them as we go along. Um, and also just to let you know that this session is being recorded. We encourage you to follow us on social media, but also tweet about this session during it. Um, and you know, you can see our, sand our handles here. Um, and please use the hashtag JSPG events, NSPN 2021 and hashtag SciPol Symposium. So now I'd like to give you some background about the Journal of Science Policy and Governance or JSPG. So I'll put our website in the chat so you all can explore in your free time, but I will let you all know that JSPG is an internationally recognized open access 
peer-reviewed research publication, as well as a 501c3 nonprofit organization. It's managed by and for students, policy fellows, and early career scholars of all academic and professional backgrounds. But we are more than just a journal. We provide an independent platform for the next generation of STEM and policy leaders and elevate the voices of young scholars in policy. Through the publication, through their publications in JSPG, authors are able to gain credibility in science policy and can leverage their writing for, in, for policy engagement as well as participate in debate and discourse in science and technology policy. And so our mission. So JSP's mission really is to help students and early career scholars bolster their research and writing credentials in the areas of science and technology policy. We really encourage everyone to engage and contribute to the policymaking process at all levels. So not just thinking on the federal level, but also local and state, and also thinking globally. We contribute to the professional growth of our authors by helping them write for a diverse set of audiences. And in addition to that, um, the publications we actively promote via social media, through our global mailing list, through individual and organizational outreach, other channels, and including our podcast called SciPole Bites. Um, and then also just in addition to that, being a part of a presentation and a workshop like this is another opportunity where we really allow our authors to kind of get their names out there and um, bolster their portfolio in science, technology, and policy. So JSBG, we publish um, a variety of formats and they're all listed here. Um, and today we'll be focusing on policy memos, but we also publish op-eds, technology assessments, analyses, and many others. Um, our articles really do cover every single corner of science and technology policy. You can see a very, very long list here, um, but we publish even more than that. And so some of the topics that are included, obviously today we'll be talking a lot about um, things that relate to climate change and climate resiliency, but we also do things around artificial intelligence, STEM education workforce, science communication, and those are just a few examples of the things that we focus on here at the journal. So here's a slide of just some graphics to show you all the ways that we, we work to elevate the voices of our early career author, authors um, through events and our podcast. So here you can see in the top corner, we recently published an issue with AAAS and the Kavli Foundation. And this was very much so inspired by science, the endless frontier. Um, we also hold workshops and webinars. Um, here you see we had one with AAAS, and this was very focused on the science and technology fellowship programs and understanding how you can become competitive for those fellowships um, and advance your career in science policy. We also have our podcast that I mentioned earlier called SciPol Sound Bites. And you can see here, there are two authors that we featured. And during this podcast, they were able to really talk more in depth about their pieces that they submitted to the journal. And in addition to that, we are always doing workshop training. Um, we tagged up with NSPN in the past to do some workshop training to write science policy memos. And we also help host a science policy certificate program um, with UC Irvine. And we uh, had our first session the summer of 2020, and we just had our second round summer of 2021. And it's really an excellent opportunity to get a, a great introduction to science policy all around. And so many of our events can be found on our YouTube page. Um, so I'm gonna take the time to drop that link in our chat so you all can go explore our YouTube page and see a lot of the workshops and events that we've had in the past. So now we'll get into the bulk of our presentation. Um, we're going to hear from our published authors and they are really gonna walk through the breakdown of the structure of an effective policy memo. You'll hear some great tips on how to write a memo. And afterwards we'll do some practice um, writing a policy memo outline, probably in breakout rooms. So as I mentioned before, please feel free to raise your virtual hand throughout the presentation if you have a question. Um, or also, you know, just pop that question in the chat and we will address it as soon as possible. 
So next we will, I'll hand it over to Yuki and she will start us off by introducing us to the principles of policy memo writing. Hi everyone, thanks for being here today. My name is Yuki and I recently submitted a policy memo that was talking about urban greening. So how uh, resources are allocated to different parts of a city um, to provide residents access to nature. And specifically my policy memo was about trees. So for example, I'm in LA where there are a lot of palm trees, which are very aesthetically pleasing. Um, but if you think about it, you don't get a whole lot of shade from a palm tree. Um, so maybe there are some things that have been taken for granted about the way that we plant trees in a city um, that could be improved, especially um, with increased threat of um, urban, um, urban heating during climate change. So principles of policy memo writing. The goal is to provide analysis and recommendations for a specific audience um, regarding a specific problem. Um, so that's all well and good, but where do you start? So there could be lots of topics that you're interested in. And if you have a sense of what you would wanna explore in a policy memo, um, that's absolutely great. I think that you can really start with doing research and then let that shape the specifics of what you're gonna end up focusing on. Because as you learn, what you understand to be central to the issue um, should shift because we're probably coming into this not already being total experts on the topic. Um, so these are just some places where I think it's really, really helpful to start. So the three no's. The first is to know your audience. So the policy memo is in theory something that could be handed to someone who is a decision maker, a lawmaker, and that could aid them um, in understanding an issue and implementing change. Um, so narrowing it down, whatever issue that you're interested in, so for example, my issue, which is urban greening, is really applicable across the country, across different states and different muni municipalities and counties. Um, but I did choose which one to focus on, which ultimately I focus on the city of LA. Um, so that's one place that you could start um, knowing who you are. So what's your influence here? So are you a constituent? Are you gonna be giving this to someone who, um, you are part of the representative's um, voting district, for example. That's something that's good to know. Um, are you a member of a professional society and are you able to speak on behalf of them? Is that a coordinated effort that you're now representing? Um, so individuals represent a collection of special interests. How do you fall into that? Uh, knowing your timing. So what is the current political climate? Has there been something passed recently um, where people are gonna be less keen maybe to adjust or because something's been passed recently, is it actually that there's a lot of room there to then direct how the, the change will happen and therefore your recommendation is actually gonna be really, really helpful and timely. So understanding that political climate is really key to having an effective policy memo as well. Because again, the goal is to put this into someone's hands and have this be a guidance for them, something that, that helps. Um, and also, yeah, what is the collective social consciousness at the time? Um, yeah, there's gonna be certain things that um, constituent voters are paying more attention to. And that is something that when you mention stakeholders, which other people will um, mention later when they go more through the structure of the, um, of the policy memo, what constituents think is really gonna play a huge role if your targeted um, lawmaker is someone who um, is, is voted in. Um, next slide, please, Nicole. So the principles of policy memo writing continued. Um, so you want it to be targeted. So like I mentioned, we have the three no's and something that I think is a really helpful tool for this is if you look at the figure here is something called um, power mapping. So this graphic is just an example, but knowing who your target is and what social network or government network, power network that they fall into. So for example, if we are writing a policy memo about, you know, choosing what kind of trees are appropriate for an arid climate as it gets hotter, where they should go. You know, there's some effort right now to put more trees in Beverly Hills, but if you've seen photos from movies, like that's not really where we need more trees, whereas South Central LA is known for being really, really, really hot and very, very dense. There's more people than trees in a lot of the neighborhoods there, um, which, is a, which is very, very different than many other parts of LA. So let's, like, let's say there's some obvious targets, right? So one would be the Parks and Rec Department. But if we looked into that, we found that they're, they keep their 
you know, severely underfunded. A lot of their funding comes from grants. So if we come to them, it's not, they're not actually going to be the one who's very easy for them to implement it. They probably would love to, but they don't actually have, they may not have the resources. So we went further up. So the mayor has been talking about this a thousand trees initiative for quite some time, but we when we dug deeper into that, there was not a tangible plan. Sorry, someone's hammering in the background. I don't know if that's very loud and distracting. Um, so then that was that was going too high up. So what we found is that there's this group of people called the Board of Supervisors, um, a group of five people who make budgeting decisions, um, and they kind of fall at the interaction between the very specific board of, I'm sorry, Parks and Rec Department um, and the very influential mayor. So that was what we found to be the best target, for example. Um, Evidence-based, um, you know, this is really at the at the core of what we're able to do with science is, is to prevent the evidence. Um, and people will talk about that more later, but the point I would like to make is that as much evidence as you provide, um, at the end of the day, these are very busy lawmakers and you wanna make it as easy as possible for them to understand the issue and want to help and know how to do that and be convinced that this is the best route to go. This is gonna be best for everyone. Um, they're not gonna get you know, severe pushback against it. So, so that's kind of our job too, is not just providing evidence, but framing it in a way that makes them want to take action. Um, so there's a few things components that contribute to that. So one would be limited scope. So I could say something like, there needs to be more trees in LA, plant trees in LA everywhere. Like that's a little bit overwhelming, right? So it could be, um, consider the cypress tree. The cypress tree um, uses a lot less water and provides a lot more shade than XYZ tree. Um, I could say something like this specific neighborhood, like I mentioned, has more people than trees. This could be a good place to start. So make sure to limit the scope. Um, having a feasible solution. So for example, we didn't want to say like build parks. When we were talking about parks, we were like add a park bench so that people can rest. Add a water fountain so you know dogs can cool off. People want to use it. Have trails so that people can run there. Um, and then have concise messaging. So kind of going back to some of the elementary writing rules that we learned, maybe when we were in grade school, you know, the first sentence of every paragraph should be a preview of what you're gonna have. Um, the lawmakers, they probably wanna skim this. Um, they want the intro paragraph to give them a pretty good sense of what's coming, um, just to make it very digestible. So just to reiterate, making it as easy as possible for your target to understand what you're asking for, and that's gonna make it easier for them to wanna consider implementing your recommendation. Um, next slide. Thanks so much, Nicole. And so after reading your memo, your target audience know exactly what you want them to do. And for that to be the, you know, the number one rule of communication um, from experience is to make sure that you're, you're tailoring it to your audience. So skimmable, every word should ser serve a purpose. Um, so there's so much information that you can pack onto this. Something that's been really challenging is it's just, every facet of this is so interesting, but you can't, you can't dive into everything. So I think like taking some step back, getting someone to read it, um, you know, really being really harsh with cutting um, is helpful because if you do what you think is important, your policy memo is going to be like a thousand pages long, maybe. Um, limited jargon acronyms, you know, knowing that we are, we're coming from a different angle as STEM um, and limited editorializing. So trying to be as objective as possible, um, not saying like, you know, shamefully the city, like, no, 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 no. Like that's not really gonna make them, you know, wanna be on your side if they're if they're feeling a little bit attacked or be like shockingly, um, blah, 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 having a stat, letting the stat uh, speak for itself. And I'm just seeing a question in the chat. So are power maps a useful illustration for the publication or just for your personal use for setting up the publication? Um, the context in which I was speaking was just a plan for yourself, but um, Tara will talk about this later about figures for the paper. I'm sure there are contexts in which that would be useful. So that's a great question. That was my last slide. So I'll pass it on to Brittany. Thanks, Yuki. Brittany? Yeah, um, next slide. Okay, there we go. All right, yeah, so uh, we'll go over the basic structure of a policy memo now. Um, so um, it does depend a little bit on the type of memo. So there's a few different types, which we won't get into, but there's like briefer, like follow up to questions. Um, generally speaking, um, they are obviously very short. Um, you have to assume that you're, the person that you're writing to is very busy and very short on time, as Yuki already mentioned. 
Um, so typically like a standard memo would be about like two to three pages or like 2000 words. Um, so there's, but for all memos, there's this a general framework, um, which is the executive summary, which is sort of the abstract to like, if you think of like a scientific abstract, it's sort of like that, but for memos, um, it just basically summarizes the entire thing and it's very short and concise. Um, your policy recommendation has to go in there. Um, and so I'll talk about that more specifically. Um, and so then for like the background or the introduction, um, that's where you really want to start incorporating, you know, build up your case that this is an issue and that this is something that they should care about. And so the way you do that, um, stats and data are your friends. So saying things like this affects X percent of Americans or this is costing billions of dollars. Um, examples of this exact problem playing out. <clears throat> And then um, options analysis, which Tara will get into later, but generally um, you provide two to three policy options. Um, they should all be feasible. They should all be something that your target audience could conceivably do. Um, and um, you kind of go into, for each one, you'll do advantages and disadvantages, kind of cost benefit analysis. Um, and so you should have advantages and disadvantages for every single one. Um, and so it should be feasible, but you should also incorporate, if you can, dollar amounts, because that's what politicians care about a lot of the time is um, how much is this actually gonna cost? So that could go either way. Like if you say um, something like, it might be a disadvantage if like a certain policy option might be a little bit steep in the price. Um, so then you might be like, well, this is better, but it would cost a lot of money. Or you could say it and you can give dollar amounts in a way that's, um, you know, like you're wasting money doing it this way, the way that we've been doing it. And so if you implement these changes, we'd actually be saving money. Uh, and then you kind of go through all the policy options and then um, based on, you know, your research and all the evidence, you come up with your final policy recommendation. Um, so a lot of the times you'll hear um, this bottom line up first, uh, or I usually say bottom line up front. <laughs> but, um, you know, just as, as you already mentioned, be clear and compelling. Um, this is the hardest part of memo writing, but just try to be as concise as humanly possible. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about um, the executive summary and the introduction. Um, so our policy memo was about um, bike paths in Madison and how you know installing bike paths are really any green infrastructure, but Madison maintains a very extensive bike path um, system, um, usually one of the top 10 in the country, um, I think. <laughs> So they, we have like a ton of bike paths here. We have a lot of bike infrastructure um, and you know they're always looking to expand it. Um, but with any type of green infrastructure, including bike paths, um, there's always a risk for gentrification in the area that these improvements are taking place in. Um, and so that was our main issue. And so when we talk about, you know, why they should care and, um, you know, it's because, you know, there's so many, bike paths here that they're developing or currently developing and you know it runs the risk of displacing vulnerable communities um so in the executive summary um we do you have to state why they should care um as i mentioned it's basically a summary of the whole um memo and so here we're saying you know yes obviously green infrastructure is good it decreases co2 emissions and then we say that this has unintended consequences that we should really take into account during development. Um, so it's very short. And then you also should put the policy recommendation in there. Um, so that, you know, as I, as I mentioned before, you have to assume that the person you're writing to is short on time. Um, the other thing is just make sure that you address, you already know when you start writing your, your, um, your policy memo, who you're addressing it to, but make sure that like, you're actually addressing them directly. So in our case, it's the city of Madison. So the city of Madison, specifically the mayor. So we say the city of Madison has this problem. The city of Madison should do this to resolve it. Um, and so this is 
usually written last because you have to know your policy memo, your policy memo, you have to know your, your final policy recommendation. Um, so usually you do all the research and then just summarize it here. So you, this is the first thing that they'll read, but the last thing that you'll write. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the introduction gives you a little bit more space to kind of state what the problem is. Um, so we went into a little bit more detail. Um, so obviously, if you have more um, tax revenue from the increased property taxes, that's also another good thing. Um, but you can, like I mentioned before, this is going to displace people who live in the area. And also the other issue here is that this would also create um, inequitable access to bike paths as well. So um, not only are communities being displaced, but they also don't have access to the green infrastructure. Um, so you can kind of build on um, what the issue is here. And then also, again, try to make your case that this is re the real problem that they should really care about. Um, so a lot of policy memos will have, like I mentioned before, a lot of stats, a lot of statistics, you know, trying to really make the case that this is a big issue. So in our case, we cited, we did a couple of things, but just to highlight a few points, um, we cited a pretty egregious example of green gentrification happening in Chicago with this 606, um, which just um, led to a lot of displacement. And then um, they did try to resolve it, but it was after the fact that the gentrification already happened. And so it was just like any measure that they took was just like trying to stop the bleeding at that point. Um, and so we're making the case that you should be proactive and think about the potential impact of green gentrification during or before development. Um, and so that was one of the things we used to kind of build our case that they should care. And the other thing is more specifically in Madison, because this is a local issue, um, we um, highlighted three projects that are currently underway or recently completed that are in gentrifying areas. Um, so like it's happening right in our own backyard. Um, so you should, they should care and they have no public facing acknowledgement that this is a thing that really happens. So um, it's a good space to kind of just, you know, make your case and make the person you're writing to care about it. And with that, I will pass it on to Tara. Hi folks, uh, before we get into figures in this particular one here, I'll give you an overview of the policy memo that the team I was on worked on. Um, so we're based in the Boston area, and we looked at um, a project that's, that's happening in Bunker Hill where there is public housing, and it's one of the oldest public housing units in the US. So as you can imagine, it's um, pretty old rundown, there are health issues, and it's um, in, in need of reconstruction to make it safer for residents. So the, the city of Boston has proposed um, redeveloping the, the housing to, to make it safer and add a lot of other improvements, which is awesome. Um, but in doing that in the construction process, they're going to end up taking down a lot of mature trees which provide benefits um, in reducing air pollution and also providing a lot of cooling for the area, which is a concern um, for urban heat island effect and, and especially as climate change progresses. Um, so we're looking at how do we address this, this issue of providing good, healthy housing while also addressing um, the, the potential risk of heat for residents there. Um, and so as we get into thinking about figures, um, it's, it's great to think about how you can get across your point and how you can use a visual medium to do that. Um, we can see with the power of social media that so many, so many media are becoming much more visual and we see the power of these images and using infographics and how an image can help you get across your message and get across data and information much more easily, um, sometimes than reading through a paragraph of text. So here in this figure, we wanted to think about how do we communicate the need that this community has for these pulling benefits of tree canopy. Um, and so what we did is presented in the first, the left image, which is kind of blue scale, that shows you how much cooling supply there currently is in different areas of Boston. And that cooling supply basically means how many trees which provide a lot of cooling. So you can see there's some areas of Boston that are darker blue, which have a lot of trees. Um, and then some areas which are paler where it's, it's very dense, very concrete and built up and there, there are many trees there. And then you can see that we, 
we zoom in in the box in that area outlined in the dotted black line is specifically the Bunker Hill housing. Um, so then you can see that in comparison to other areas in Boston, there's medium to low cooling um, and tree cover in that, that area. And then in the right panel, um, we, we present this heat vulnerability index, which is this measure of how vulnerable people are to, to heat it affects. And that's based on um, factors including age, race, income, language spoken, and living situation. So the darker red colors mean that people in a certain area are much more vulnerable to, to heat events, heat stress, heat stroke, and other heat-related health effects. So we can see um, in that, that blow up of that Bunker Hill housing, it's a much darker red than that surrounding area and, then, and darker than many other areas of Boston. So we have these paired images of showing there's this housing in, in unit that both needs more cooling, it's lower in, in tree cover than many areas in Boston, and also the residents of that area are much more vulnerable to heat. So this is starting off by highlighting why this is important, why we need to be able to provide more cooling for the residents there to keep them safe. And next slide, please, Nicole. Next, we get into how are we going to address this issue? You, you know, like Brittany was talking about in the introduction figures, you're convincing someone this is an issue you should care. And you want to get to convincing them, what are the ways to solve this issue and why should you do that? So first, um, as both Yuki and Brittany were talking about, you need to know who your audience is and what power they have, what actions are in their, their capacity to take. So for us, this is the city of Boston who has proposed this plan to redevelop the area. Um, and also has the power to change that plan. Um, if cutting down trees is a lot of problem and it's going to decrease cooling for residents in the area. And we wanna come up with a few different policy options that are within the city's capacity to do. Um, and so one of those that we came up with was installing green roofs, which can cool an area a lot. Um, then painting the roofs white are another option since just having white color reflects a lot more sunlight back up. So that's cooling. Um, and you also want to present what are the consequences of inaction? Because not doing anything seems like it's not making a choice, but that is in and of itself a choice. So you also want to present that as not neutral, but in making a decision to not do anything. And that there are also consequences, pros and cons to staying with the status quo and leaving the plan as it is. So we've organized those options from the first being our top recommendation, green roofs, second, white roofs, an option can help with cooling, but not as good as green roofs. Um, and then addressing what happens if the city doesn't take any actions. Uh, next slide, please. And then for each of these, you wanna go through the pros and cons. And that helps to solidify your argument because it shows you really thought through all these options. And thinking that through means presenting the downsides as well. Everything's gonna have pros and cons. So if you're presenting that um, we've thought this through, we've weighed the pros and cons already for you, and we're presenting that analysis as, so that we're saying, we've already done that, and we're telling you which is the best of these, convincing you which option we think is the best of these, once you've taken all those different factors into account. And it also provides you an opportunity to argue against some of the, the cons. Um, if you don't address them, um, whoever you're presenting the policy memo to could bring those up and you, there's not as much space to argue. Whereas if you show that up front in your memo, you can present, okay, so there are some downsides. It's, nothing's perfect. But you can also address those and say, here's why this downside isn't that serious or here's why the upsides um, outweigh the downside and why you should still go ahead with this option. So for this example, we present for green roofs that um, advantages include the, the uh, cooling capacity, but also a lot of other health and community benefits of potentially having um, a garden or a farm on the roof and folks who grow food. So this is an area that's a food desert um, and low-income residents don't have a lot of access as to healthy food nearby. Um, it could be an area where folks could go to exercise or recreate or a community space. Um, so there are a lot of additional benefits um, besides the cooling. And so that really strengthens the case for this being the best option. The clear disadvantage is that it's more expensive, both upfront to install green roofs, um, and also there's more ongoing maintenance for that. 
compared to, for example, a white roof, where um, the advantages are it also provides a lot of cooling, but it doesn't provide a lot of the same community benefits. Um, but it's cheaper. So that's the, the trade-off of if the city is concerned mostly about the bottom line and they're they're not willing to put in a green roof, that's a non-starter. We can present this as still an option to provide cooling for the residents while being a little less expensive. But it doesn't give some of those same health and community benefits. So that's why we argue first for green roofs. And then getting into the consequences of an action, um, that's a great space to point out um, what, what the downsides are if they don't change this, talking about um, it's, not, it's not neutral, there are still consequences as there are ways that residents will be affected by heat, will be affected by air pollution, and that they can work to combat some of those, those negative consequences by taking one of the previous policies instead. And we also point out um, to, to strengthen the case of other actions that the city of Boston has taken, um, we list here the Boston's uh, Climate Action Plan, to, to show how taking these actions that we recommend would be in line with values and policies that the city has already stated. So that helps to strengthen the case as well. And next slide, please. And lastly, um, you end with, what is your policy recommendation? You, you've said it, you've run through it, you've gone through all the pros and cons. And then that last paragraph is saying again, really short, really strong, what do we recommend you do and why? So here we say we recommend and green roofs because they provide a lot of cooling, um, and they also provide a lot of these great community health benefits as well. Um, and so that's so if it's really short and your policymaker is in a rush and they're not going to read the whole thing in detail, they can just go to the end and get the short and sweet, what they, should they do and why, and you're getting your message across really clearly. And I'll pass back to Nicole. Thanks. Thanks, Tara. Um, and so now before we move on, um, we did have a question in the chat that I really think that any author could address. And so the question says, what are your most trusted sources for economic impact slash costs, since that's not usually as easily accessible or interpretable as scientific stats or publications? Does anyone have any suggestions for that question? I would say I don't have a go-to source. I think it's really dependent on the issue. It'd be nice if there were like one database that just analyzes everything. I, I think it more depends on your issue and digging into, um, that definitely is more challenging. I know for some of our, um, we would use EPA stats for what's the cost, you know, like per square footage of roof or putting in a green roof versus, versus a white roof. Um, so sometimes government sources are good, um, but that's definitely a good thing to look into as well as you do that research of um, who's it done by, if it's less standardized, who's the funder, checking into those, those built-in biases. Yeah, I can address yeah. this question. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, 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 go ahead. Yeah, I agree um, with Tara that you know, there isn't one source and, you know, as scientists, like we know how to parse through scientific literature and know what's, what's credible. Um, and so it was definitely a bit of a shift to start reading about more public policy related things. Um, one thing that uh, I did for this policy memo that I hadn't done for others, which I found really helpful, is that I was reaching out to experts and lawmakers to get a bit of an understanding of what was already in the works with related issues. And a lot of that was related to funding because that tends to be the number one consideration. Um, so for example, before I decided to parse it down and only talk about LA, some people in my student group at UCLA had met with California state senators offices who are working on a climate bill. And from talking to them, we found that the way that the bill that they were working on was being funded, um, and part of that was gonna include green spaces, which is why we wanted to talk to them, um, was, a, was a bond measure. And we learned that bond measures cannot be allocated towards maintenance, which was a big part of our policy proposal was to advocate for maintenance of existing spaces rather than making huge new green spaces. Um, so that was something that you know may be um, very obvious to people who have been in the public sphere for a long time, but that was a big learning point for me just by having those conversations. And then once I was focusing on LA, I reached out to a university professor um, who lives here who's been working on an urban greening project and that's how I learned that some of the city initiatives were um, not something that he personally was counting on panning out 
So that was a good way for us to learn that even though that there were some talk of implementation of changes that that wasn't necessarily something that would largely affect the issue, at least with our context. Um, and he was talking about how like the university project was right now mostly funded by donors to, um, that the school had coordinated. And then even though they were in conversation with the city that no money had actually changed hands yet. So that was, um, yeah, I would, I would, especially as students, like I've never reached out to someone like a professor or even honestly a lawmaker with wanting to have a conversation and been ignored, I think. Pretty sure that's true. So people are really willing to talk to students. That's all. It's very helpful, yeah. And I would say, you know, a lot of these things they're required to, if you're dealing with the government, they're required to give you a lot of information just because you're a citizen. So, um, you know, asking the right questions can go a long way. Are there any other questions before we shift to the next part of our session today? Okay, great. So now it's you all's turn. Um, and so we are going to move into breakout groups um, in which you will work. Um, there'll be three breakout groups. Each author will moderate one and they will be assisting with helping to develop a policy memo outline for a topic that's related to this year's conference theme um, for adapting to a changing planet. Um, so during this time, you're able to also ask more questions, but the bulk of it will be used to develop a memo outline and you'll have about the next 30 minutes to do so. So before we head into those groups, are there any questions? All right, great. So I will put you all in your groups now. So looks like we have everyone back. Um, we have about 10 minutes left. So we're going to use that time to recap what we discussed in our breakout rooms. Um, and we will start with Brittany's group. Um, Brittany, did you want to lead us off today? Uh, sure. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm just getting organized. Oh, totally uh, okay. <laughs> okay, no, I'm good now. Um, all right, yeah, so we kind of looked at the problem of addressing um, continued access to healthcare in the event of extreme weather events. Um, and so pretty similar to the last time we talked about this, um, there was a lot of stakeholders, um, hospitals, insurance companies, the community in general, patients, their families, first responders, governors, um, and so we looked at this as a governor who could kind of act on a more political scale and kind of, you know, has maybe the agencies available to them that could, um, you know, you know, come up with plans and emergency preparedness plans. Um, so um, we thought a lot about like kind of like the landscape of the problem. So one of the things like if we were actually going to write a memo about this, we'd look into it would be like, you know, what are the current plans? Are there current plans in case of weather events? Um, how much has weather actually impacted um, hospitals in the area and what kind of impact it has? So if it was like a lot of fires that, and power outages that might look different than flooding where there might be more transportation issues there too. Um, and then what sort of infrastructure would already be there? So these are the kind of the things that we would kind of think about um, we detailed a couple of different ideas. Um, so one of them was coming up with kind of a tiered plan, like should, uh, um, you know, an event happen, um, which hospitals could immediately go back on versus which ones um, could come back on later. And so this would kind of help, like if it was a rural area and that was like the only hospital, like having, if like the governor's office had people available to them to kind of identify who these, what hospitals these are. Um, obviously a disadvantage would be that like you'd get pushback from communities if you were like, though this one's not the highest priority. Um, the other one is kind of similar, but it deals with plans more for moving people and communication. So if we could come up with a way to establish communication lines between hospitals, we'd probably have to like flesh out these ideas a little bit more if we were actually writing a real memo. But um, just kind of like, obviously it would be huge if you could just like look at and see, you know, this hospital has X amount of people and we can move people there um, in the case of an emergency, if it was like a database or something. Um, Again, you'd get kind of maybe dissent 
um, from different hospitals if um, they're not kind of prioritized. And then actually putting money into infrastructure, which is similar to what we discussed in the last one. Um, uh, again, the disadvantage would be that the money could go elsewhere. So the governor might be more immediately concerned about roads um, versus long-term planning. Um, and so we recommended, I, A and the, the first two with the kind of developing plans, um, seem like it could be really easily implemented and has a low financial investment, but a higher impact. So you're not actually putting in infrastructure, but you are planning ahead of time. So um, either one of those, we didn't have the time to decide formally, but yeah, uh, that's it. Sounds good. Thanks, Brittany. Yuki, did you want to go next? Sure. I'm actually going to have Tara from my group report. Great. Yeah. Hi there. Um, so I'd had an idea running through my head about a potential policy memo or an issue that I see on the horizon, which is that the National School Lunch Program um, is supposed to be renewed every five years. And the last time it was renewed in 2015, and apparently this is now becoming you know, quite a major issue in terms of ensuring that students are getting healthy food. <clears throat> and so my proposal, my proposal would be combating climate change through the National School Lunch Program, save our planet and save our gut. The statement of importance, um, so there's data to suggest that moving to a more plant-based diet would decrease stress on the planet and also on the community structure of our gut microbiome. The National School Lunch Program provides billions of lunches per year to our nation's growing children. We could combat climate change and improve health throughout our longer lifespans by decreasing animal products and increasing non-wheat-based complex carbohydrates in the National School Lunch Program. Because I did notice that the majority of the complex carbohydrate uh, verbiage and infographic seems to focus primarily on wheat-based foods, which aren't healthy for everyone and an overabundance isn't healthy for anyone anyway. And so, um, some things that we discussed were, were how we could consolidate the politics and the science behind this, considering that a lot of people don't really understand the importance the gut microbiome plays in terms of our health and how that type of verbiage can be reconciled from one group to another, um, how to combat uh, public misinformation in terms of you know, being able to take probiotics and that just kind of like restoring the health of your gut, which is not at all true. And uh, basically how to convince parents and the general public that this would be a good idea. Um, also talking a bit about the budget. Um, so focusing a lot on the health risks um, because someone from pharma or other profiting sectors of healthcare might be pretty adamant to shut down a proposal like that. <clears throat> um, because, you know, over time, um, consuming a, a greater wider variety of complex carbohydrates they show usually decreases things like diabetes and high blood pressure, et cetera, things that the pharmaceutical companies make a lot of money off of. Um, and so if you could kind of predict like who these stakeholders would be and what modes by which they would be using to push back, then that would be kind of helpful because you're kind of calling them out before they've even said anything. And that in the long term, this could offset costs in terms of health costs for people um, whose gut microbiome is then impacted for the rest of their life from eating, you know, a, a, not a lot of different complex carbohydrates from childhood on. And so um, also maybe looking into some data concerning higher educational achievement by eating complex carbohydrates. And I think that you could because some of the metabolites, you know, are shown to be very beneficial in terms of like keeping your colon and everything very healthy. And if your colon is very healthy, your microbiome is always talking to it and you want the two to be working in tandem. So I think, you know, it could be really beneficial and that the costs involved with, you know, training people to prepare these other sorts of like, you know, diverse lentils and other legumes and things um, might be offset by decreasing the amount of like whole meat and animal products in the diet. And thank you for listening. Yeah, thanks Tara for sharing a very uh, relevant issue. And I will always say it's always interesting when it comes to policymakers, they are always willing to bend the needle a lot for children. So focusing on school lunches is actually not only important, but very tactical as well, because it's something that could probably actually get done. Um, all right, so gonna toss it to the other Tara. Um, Tara, did you have anyone from your group who's reporting out or were you gonna report out for this? Yeah, Ramon is going to, to share for our group. Great, the floor is yours, um, Ramon. Do you have the document though that I can read from? <laughs> I don't have it pulled up right now. 
Uh oh. Okay. Um, I'll try to remember what we said then. So, um, I don't know. Maybe for lack. Go ahead. And I was gonna say I could probably pull it up, but go ahead and get started as okay. I. Okay. Um, I don't know whether for lack of, uh, of uh, creativity or not, but for some reason we kind of stuck back to the concept of uh, urban heat, which was mentioned during the initial talk anyways. Um, so we mentioned, number one, uh, the concept of urban heat and, you know, which population specifically that would affect because that will then determine which decision makers you try to engage with. So if it's, um, you know, a broader uh, issue of say a really urbanized state that has multiple cities like California, then there'll there'll be several uh, state legislators, for example, that you could engage with versus maybe something that's a place that's more rural and might not necessarily be as easy to address. And the, the focus group in this case that we chose would just be like urban heat and low income communities within urban um, setting. So then we looked at the different options and some of them were, were cheaper and didn't require as much uh, investment from the community and some were more um, involved and they included things like repainting of roads and bridges so that you have more reflective capabilities, um, uh, planting more, okay, yeah, perfect. Um, planting more trees, um, I think, yeah, we're done by policy options. And yeah, we did pros and cons for both. You know, some of them are more costly, and but some of them are more long lasting than others. Um, we also mentioned either retrofitting buildings or building new -er buildings, which could be a little bit more long term and uh, beneficial towards keeping folks from having heat stroke, but they're usually either more expensive on the front end can lead to gentrification and especially with retrofitting, it may not even be that long-term anyways. So we settled on two achievable goals further down, which were essentially, you know, what is least costly and least disruptive for folks, because those are gonna be the ones that people choose likely first and what's most politically feasible. So things like um, planting trees would be, a little bit more politically feasible because I don't know of a single politician who would say we need less trees in a per particular locale. Um, and we talked about then, you know, how do you get your, where, 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 how do we implement this? Well, ideally any kind of change like this and any kind of physical change would require um, some type of investment. So what would the tax base for that investment, or, or what would the investment look like, whether it's a tax, tax based or whether it's a fee for use kind of thing. Like if you go to the park, you have to pay a fee and that's how they're paying for more trees. Um, and because it's a, an investment of this type, we decided to highlight the cost of inaction. And so maybe highlight stats on heat stroke and, 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 and issues with, um, with, terrain and 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 the if you're not planting a tree you know how ugly it might look or something um and and the specific areas where you can implement this where it would be uh the most achievable or the most impactful um with the ultimate solution of lowering heat great that sounds great and these all sound like really great ideas and like you all had a lot of great discussion within your groups. Um, and so before we're a little over time, so before we get out of here, I just wanna share a couple of things with you and I'll promise to be very, very quick. Um, and so um, hopefully you can see my slides again. Um, just wanna let you all know that JSBB does have a call to papers right now. Um, this is for policy position papers or op-eds. Um, and just to let you know, um, if you're unfamiliar with how to write an op-ed or a policy position paper, we recently held a writing workshop with Dr. Deborah Stein that can be found on our YouTube page. Um, and she walks through that process. So um, we're um, looking for papers January 23rd, 2022, very focused on STEM education and workforce development. So if any of you all are interested, we hope you will take advantage of that. 
Also, I um, wanted to let you all know before we got out of here that we are having a call for applications for associate editors. Um, and the call for applications will be January 17th through March 6th. You can learn more about that on our careers page at our website. Um, but really wanted to let you all know now because we are going to have an open house for those who are interested in being associate editors um, where you can learn more about it and, and ask a lot of questions. So that's December 6th at 5 p.m. and the registration can be found on that website as well. One last quick thing before we head out, um, JSPG is having another fireside chat with one of our leaders from our governing board, Lida Benison, who is a senior program officer at the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. Um, we're going to be talking a lot about how higher education can provide particular professional development to prepare graduate students and postdoctoral scholars to be uh, more productive in non-academic and academic careers within the scientific workforce. So we hope you will join us for these events. I'm going to drop all these links that I just talked about in the chat um, and you can check them out in more detail for yourself. Um, also, you know, visit our YouTube page and really take a look around to see if there's any interesting things that you'd like to view. And with that, I will leave you all. I wanna thank you all for sticking around and, and in participating in this workshop today. Um, and please uh, reach out to us if you have any questions and check us out on social media for all the things that we're doing um, for the community. So have a great evening, afternoon, whatever time it is where you are um, and enjoy the rest of your weekend.